Um, welcome to our gardening and landscaping class today. How's the volume? Is that a little better? Okay. Um, first, I want to thank our, our partner and our sponsor today, City of Lakeland Water Utilities and also City of Lakeland Storm, Lakes and Storm Water for coming out and um, giving a presentation for those who were in person, um, gave some great information um, ahead of time. So thank you for that. Um, but this Lunch and Learn is sponsored by City of Lakeland Water Utilities. Just wanna introduce myself. I'm Julie Schell. I'm the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program Coordinator with the University of Florida IFAS Extension, Polk County. Um, our webinar team often consists of myself or our residential horticulture agent and master gardener volunteer coordinator, Ann Yazalanis. And we also have um, a master gardener volunteer helping in person today. And then we also have um, one online as well. So thank you both for helping make um, this run a little smoother. Couple more things before we get started. I do wanna mention that we are an equal opportunity institution and we strive to reach a diverse audience. However, if you feel as though you've been discriminated against in any of ours or any USDA programming, please feel free to file a complaint. You can do so by completing the form online. You can also call them at 866-632-9992, or you can write a letter addressed to the USDA. I wanna quickly mention, so I mentioned we are the University of Florida IFAS Extension Polk County. So what does that mean? What is extension? Well, it's a partnership between the state, uh, the federal government, the local government, um, and it's a way to bring information, research, science-based information to the public. And so, uh, you know, we're here in Polk County, uh, main campus of the University of Florida in IFAS, the Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences is located in Gainesville. And so we have lots of extension programming. Um, not only do we offer gardening and landscaping education that comprises of Florida-friendly landscaping, composting, uh, there's information on soil testing, nutrition and healthy living, managing um, water bodies, including lake fronts, and even um, assistance for small farmers, and of course, our master gardener volunteers. So today we're going to talk about the basics of fertilizer in the lawn and landscape. And so with that, uh, before we get into that, we're going to talk about water conservation opportunities with the City of Lakeland Water Utilities. We'll briefly talk about Florida friendly landscaping. We'll look at some general fertilizer practices that you should consider. Also some things before you even apply fertilizer, what you should be thinking about. How do you go about selecting a fertilizer? And then we'll look at tips for landscape plants. And then we'll look at fertilizing your lawn as well. But before we get started, I'm going to ask Brittany to step up and just share a little bit with us about her programming. Thank you all for coming. We do appreciate this. Um, this is a like a co-hosting type deal with UF. Um, but I am Brittany Thornton from the City of Lakeland Water Utilities Department. I am our water conservation specialist. So my job entails basically um, helping you save water and hopefully saving money as well. Um, it kind of works both ways. So some of the programs that we offer, uh, we have conservation kits that we offer for free. So if that's something you have not taken advantage of and you have a home that's an older home, um, definitely consider putting in um, an application for one of those. Uh, they're online or you can always email or call me. I'm, I'm at the office a lot, so I should be able to get back to you fairly quickly um, for those requests. So water conservation kits are free. Uh, landscape and irrigation evaluations are something that we also do for free. These are where our county um, contractor will come out to your home and he will check out your irrigation system. He'll check out your timer. Um, he makes sure that if it's running too long, that he, you know, he tells it the timer what to put in or he knows what to put into the timer uh, to shorten that up. Um, but he does a really good job of just helping you save water when you're irrigating. So that is another program. You can find out um, more information online. Uh, toilet rebates, something that we've been doing for a very long time. If you have a toilet that is older than 1994, then you should consider replacing it. We will do a $100 rebate for those. Um, it has to be 3.5 gallons or more, your old toilet, and you have to replace it with a 1.28 gallon per flush 
water sense labeled toilet. So if that, again, is something you're interested in, um, information online, you can get with me. Um, and the smart timer rebate goes along with the landscape and irrigation evaluations. Um, if you have a current irrigation timer that you're not very happy with, or you want to upgrade, this is a rebate program for you. Um, again, Preston will come out, he can install the, the new controller for you. Uh, any, basically any questions you have irrigation landscape wise, he would be able to help you with that. So um, that, that's all of our programs. And like I said, I'm here, uh, there's brochures on the table out front. So if by chance you didn't grab one, my information's on the back there as well as on the screen. So, all right. Thank you, U.S. Thank you, Sandra, for being here today. You guys are okay, wonderful. Thank you, Brittany, for sharing that information. All right, so we're gonna move along. Uh, and I just want to talk a little bit about Florida friendly landscaping. And so Florida friendly landscaping is a way that we can maintain our landscapes, but also consider protecting our natural resources, our environment. And so Florida friendly landscapes are beautiful. They're maintained landscapes and they reduce our use of water, fertilizer and pesticides, all in an effort to conserve and protect our natural resources, particularly our water resources here in Florida. So Florida Friendly has nine easy to follow principles that you can incorporate in how you maintain your landscape. And it all starts with right plant, right place. Uh, that's very appropriate for our topic today, also talking about fertilizer use. When we match plants to our site conditions, those plants are better able to thrive. They're less susceptible to pest and disease problems and hopefully uh, nutrient deficiencies as well. We also wanna water efficiently. So making sure that we're not overwatering, we're following our local water restrictions, which are year round, by the way. Um, they aren't just certain times of the year. We always have watering restrictions, just they may vary depending on um, how dry or if we're in a severe drought, they, they can change, but um, we definitely have water restrictions. Grouping our plants by water needs, utilizing micro irrigation in our landscape beds, being more conscious about how we are irrigating our lawns as well, we can have lawns and have beautiful lawns that are healthy, but we can also reduce our use of water and make sure that we're watering and keeping those lawns healthy with, with an appropriate amount of water. Fertilizing appropriately, which we'll talk a lot more about that here in just a minute. Uh, utilizing mulch in the landscape. So um, in our landscape beds, using a two to three inch layer of an organic, and by that I mean a tree-based mulch, like maybe pine straw, pine bark, melaleuca, eucalyptus, fallen leaves, even utility mulch. These are all great options to use around your plants. Just make sure you keep that mulch pulled away from the base of your plants. Um, it's gonna help retain moisture, uh, reduce soil erosion, and also reduce weeds in the landscape. Attracting wildlife is very important. Uh, with so much development that we have, we can utilize our landscapes as an opportunity to provide for wildlife, provide flowers and nectar sources for pollinators. Um, we can provide for birds and other types of wildlife in both what we plant and also how we maintain our landscapes to make sure that we're protecting um, different types of wildlife. And with that, managing yard pests responsibly. So getting out in the landscape, actually walking around, scouting either ourselves or if we hire um, landscape professionals, make sure that they incorporate integrated pest management, also known as IPM. So they scout the landscape. They know what to expect. Um, they treat as needed. We want to recycle yard waste as well. That's as simple as when you mow the lawn, leave the grass clippings on the lawn. As those clippings break down, they provide nutrients in the soil that can then be taken up. Maybe you have a tree that loses some of its leaves. You can create a self-mulching area by just letting those leaves stay there and you have mulch. Um, you can also create a, a compost pile as well. These are all ways to reduce our yard waste and keep those nutrients on site um, where they're they're better used potentially. We also want to reduce stormwater runoff. And so um, we have a, a quite a long rainy season over the summertime. We have lots of rain that falls. With all of this development that I talked about, we have lots of impervious surfaces. Surfaces like our sideway, our sidewalks, our driveways, our roads, our roofs. Rain hits that and it has to run off somewhere else. Well, along the way, that rain may pick up excess nutrients, may pick up chemicals or pollutants. And so we want to reduce that from going off site. So direct your downspouts into your lawn and landscape areas. Utilize rain burials. Include impermeable, 
include pervious surfaces where water can filter through on site rather than having to run off wherever possible. You can also incorporate a rain garden. And so that's a beautiful garden in the landscape where um, roof runoff is directed. The water stays there for less than 24 hours and is absorbed on site. It has beautiful plants that are adapted to those conditions. And then finally, we wanna protect the waterfront. And we're gonna talk more about this today, but it's so important that we think about whether um, we have a water body in our own backyard um, or not, we're affecting all of the water here in the state. So protecting the waterfront definitely includes um, incorporating a 10 foot maintenance free zone, uh, no fertilizer, no mowing, and um, no pesticide use to help protect that body of water and keep excess nutrients and chemicals out of that water. And so by utilizing these nine principles, you can see we've kind of talked about them, but what does that actually look like in your landscape? Again, we talked about utilizing a rain barrel, maybe having a compost pile. Again, thinking about right plant, right place and choosing plants appropriate for your site. Utilizing mulch, fertilizing appropriately, which we'll talk more about. Again, protecting that waterfront, providing for wildlife, managing those yard pests, getting out and scouting um, and treating only if necessary making sure that we water efficiently as well. And so this is how we can use these nine principles in our landscape. And of course, using fertilizer appropriately is one of the nine principles of Florida friendly landscaping. So now we're gonna just talk about some general fertilizer practices. And so to start, why do we even fertilize? Is it something we just think we need to do? Do we actually need to fertilize? Well, these are some questions we need to ask ourselves and look at our landscape and utilize some of the tools that we have available to us to decide if we actually need to fertilize. But again, why are we fertilizing? Maybe we need to improve our plants growth, maybe the quality of our plants. It just depends. Plants need nutrients for growth. And so that's a way, uh, often the soil provides that, but sometimes we might need to provide supplemental nutrients through fertilizer. Again, it just depends on your plants. It depends on your landscape and what's appropriate. Again, if you have lots of mature um, plants in the landscape, potentially they don't need fertilizer. Maybe you have some plants that aren't flowering as they should be. Maybe they have a nutrient deficiency or because of your soil pH, those plants aren't able to thrive as well. And so um, fertilizer may be able to help supplement some of those nutrients. That's something, something to think about. So we should have a purpose for fertilizing, not just because we saw an advertisement or we saw our neighbor fertilizing. We need to know why are we actually fertilizing and, and do these plants actually need that fertilizer? We also wanna think about you know, the time of year as well and how we're affecting, again, our environment around us. So we wanna fertilize responsibly. We wanna think about what does that mean? That means that we are putting down the appropriate type of fertilizer at the right time of year and the right amount. Because when we don't do that, we end up with excess nutrients. If we fertilize during maybe before a heavy rainstorm or we put down too much fertilizer, that fertilizer could end up getting washed away. It's gonna wash over all those surfaces, um, go down a storm drain or some, and either end up in a, a stormwater pond or a natural body of water. Those excess nutrients have consequences in those bodies of water. So again, we wanna think about how we're fertilizing, when we're fertilizing, and if it's appropriate. We wanna keep our landscape plants healthy as well so that when we fertilize, those nutrients are taken up and not just washed away. Again, more fertilizer is not better. As I mentioned, when we over fertilize or misuse fertilizer, maybe at the wrong time or use too much, we create potential excess nutrients that could be washed away due to Again, storms, heavy storms, or even um, over irrigating. If you're over irrigating, potentially you're washing all those nutrients away as well. Again, they're all washing towards something. And we have um, many natural bodies of water and many stormwater ponds. And so we wanna make sure that we're not contributing to excess nutrients that are affecting or harming those bodies of water. Because again, when we have excess nutrients, we have lower oxygen in the water, and that can also lead to um, aquatic life issues, fish kills potentially, algae growth, things like that, that um, harm that body of water and make it not as healthy as it could be, make it not function as properly as well. So some ways that you can um, utilize fertilizer in a better, better way. Always read the label. It's absolutely important. 
um, that when you buy a fertilizer, one, you know what you're buying and that you're buying on purpose, but then read the label. When should you be applying? Are there any recommendations? Do you need to do any special follow-up practices after applying that fertilizer? How much should you actually be applying? You may buy an entire bag and only need um, a small amount of that bag. Maybe you only need a quarter of the bag, less than a quarter of the bag. It just depends. And so that label is gonna be so important. You wanna make sure, as I mentioned, you may not need to use all of the fertilizer you purchased at one time. So you wanna keep that fertilizer and you wanna store it in a dry location. You don't want moisture getting to that because that can affect the quality of that fertilizer in the future. So again, store it properly, um, keep it away from anything flammable as well. So you wanna keep it in a dry location and keep it safe as well. As I mentioned earlier, do not fertilize within 10 feet of a body of water. Again, we're creating this buffer zone so that we protect that water. We're creating a zone where if any excess nutrients do get close, that hopefully that 10 foot buffer zone will take care of it. But we're staying out of that zone to decrease the amount of excess nutrients that, will get, that may end up in that body of water. Always use a lot, or you wanna utilize a deflector shield on your fertilizer spreader. If you are um, doing the fertilizer application yourself and you're using a fertilizer spreader, which again, if you're fertilizing your lawn, that's what's recommended. So that deflector shield is gonna keep that fertilizer off impervious surfaces. So you're gonna, you know, as you go by, direct that spreader so that that deflector shield keeps the fertilizer off your driveway, off your roads, again, away from that body of water as well. You're not flinging fertilizer down towards um, the lake or the stormwater pond. And then you wanna make sure that you calibrate your spreader as well. That's super critical to make sure that you're applying um, appropriately so that you don't end up with like um, strips within your lawn so that everyone knows you did not fertilize appropriately and now you have lines in your lawn potentially because either you have under fertilized some areas or maybe even burned up other areas by over applying. So it's super critical. And again, um, if you have any questions, you can always reach out to us for more information, but these are some steps you should really consider before you fertilize. If any fertilizer is spilled, again, it needs to be cleaned up. Um, we don't wanna wait for a rainstorm to wash it away because again, those nutrients have not been used up and uh, again, are gonna end up in that body of water. Also, that fertilizer could potentially damage um, your sidewalk or your driveway. So hopefully you care about the environmental impacts, but maybe you care about um, how your sidewalk or driveway is impacted. And so you definitely wanna clean it up for that as well. So don't leave fertilizer on any impervious surfaces. So use caution when you're measuring your fertilizer, when you're loading it into your spreader, um, also uh, when you're done or if you're near any sidewalks or driveways as well. Another thing to consider with fertilizer use, if you have a newly installed lawn, there's no reason to fertilize for the first 30 to 60 days. Why is that? Well, you just installed the lawn. So how did that lawn get there? How did that sod get to your home? Well, it had to be cut, right? It comes in often in squares that you purchase and either maybe you're patching an area or you just had a new lawn installed. There's not a lot of root material there. So you wanna wait 30 to 60 days for that root to start growing and regenerating before you apply any fertilizer. Because if you put fertilizer down, guess what? The grass has nothing to take it up. So again, you've wasted your time and money if you're applying fertilizer um, before it's appropriate, before that plant, especially speaking of turf grass, is ready to take it up. Another thing to consider with your landscape plants, maybe you're installing a new tree or a new shrub. There's no need to apply fertilizer in that planting hole. It's not gonna help that plant establish any faster. And again, think about it. You're putting the plant and you're trying to establish it. So again, we want those roots to start, re to start growing and for that plant to become established before we apply fertilizer. We want that plant to be healthy, um, ready to take up nutrients. We don't want to um, stress it and potentially burn it up by putting fertilizer in that planting hole. So when should we be applying fertilizer? Well, step one is when plants are actively growing. We're getting to that point, right? Uh, many plants are starting to uh, put off new uh, shoots, new leaves. So we're almost there, we're getting to that point. So we wanna fertilize when plants are actively growing. We also wanna watch the weather. We don't wanna fertilize maybe when it's uh, not growing. So when would that? Even though um, we still have mild winters here, 
plants are not growing as actively during our winter months here in Florida. So we don't need to fertilize. If plants have gone dormant, there's no need to fertilize them as well. Uh, maybe you have a tree that's gone dormant. Maybe you have a lawn like bahia grass that has gone dormant. You don't need to fertilize it in the winter time. You also don't wanna fertilize before a heavy rainstorm. I've mentioned that already. But again, um, if you apply that fertilizer and you think about how much rain comes down in one of our summer storms, that fertilizer is just getting washed away. Again, so it didn't do any good to apply that at that time. So again, you wanna think about also, so we're thinking about the timing. So the time of year, the months when the plants are growing, not before a heavy rainstorm. We also wanna think about our plants. Do you actually need to apply fertilizer? Remember, many of your mature woody trees and shrubs do not need supplemental irrigation. So again, lots of factors to consider. Another thing to consider is when are you allowed to apply? Um, so many um, local municipalities, uh, cities, counties have individual fertilizer ordinances that restrict when fertilizer can be applied. You also wanna think about, do your plants need fertilizer? And have you done a pH test to determine what type of fertilizer is appropriate, if any is needed at all? One way to help you if you want to find out if your um, local county or city has any special fertilizer ordinances is there is a Florida Friendly Landscaping fertilizer um, app. It's, you don't have to download it. Um, you can just uh, access it online, either on your uh, mobile phone or online on your computer as well. And you can type in your location and see if there are any special restrictions for applying fertilizer, like potentially any blackout periods or anything. With that, since we are here in uh, the city of Lakeland, Polk County, I wanted to address Polk County's fertilizer ordinance and just make sure everyone is aware of what are the um, limitations or uh, you know how to best fertilize here in Polk County. So. I know it's a lot of text there, but I just, I've highlighted a few of the key points that you wanna consider. So you don't wanna fertilize within 10 feet of a water body. So no fertilizer within that 10 foot buffer zone. No fertilizer should be blown off any or onto any impervious surfaces or stormwater drains. So again, we're not blowing or washing that spilled fertilizer down the storm drain or onto the, onto the, the roadways or driveways. That's um, not allowed in our ordinance. That low maintenance zone that I talked about that also includes no mowing and no pesticide use is strongly recommended. And Florida Friendly Landscaping would definitely encourage that. Broadcast spreaders must be equipped with deflector shields. Polk County Fertilizer Ordinance requires that. And finally, um, another the final key point is no grass clippings or vegetative debris um, blown off into stormwater drains, water bodies, sidewalks, or roadways. So again, if you've mowed the lawn or some leaves have fallen, don't help those leaves along the way down the, the road or your driveway. Sweep them back into the lawn or sweep them and put them in a compost pile or something, um, but definitely no blowing them down storm drains. That's against our fertilizer ordinance here in Polk County. So I just wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page and we're all following the rules. Again, these rules are to help protect our natural resources. Um, we've talked so much about keeping our water bodies healthy. And so these excess nutrients definitely have an impact on that. So a little bit more about thinking about fertilizer and deciding, do you actually need to fertilize? Well, you wanna make sure that you're familiar with your plants. What should you be looking for? What does a nutrient deficiency actually look like in the leaves of your plants? What are those symptoms? Well, you might see what's called yellow or chlorotic leaves. So if you see that yellowing in your leaves, that might be a sign. Now there could be some other issues. So of course you wanna consider, uh, potentially if you had a shade loving plant that you were growing in full sun, you might see yellow leaves. So again, it takes, some, it takes a little bit of, of, again, that integrated pest management, getting out in the landscape, thinking about what are your plants? What are the site conditions? How are you maintaining those plants or maybe not maintaining those plants? And how could that be affecting those plants? So if you're looking for a nutrient deficiency and you see some yellowing, the way to tell a disease versus a nutrient deficiency is it's going to be more symmetrical if it's a nutrient deficiency. So you can see that photo on the right of that leaf. That's actually what we call intervenal chlorosis. 
And that is a symptom of one type of nutrient deficiency. So if you see that potentially, that could be going on. Now, again, um, there's many factors at play. What is your soil pH? How are you irrigating? Um, right, thinking about right plant, right place. But these are some clues to kind of help you what's going on. If it was a disease, it would be more sporadic and not as symmetrical on the leaves. And know your plants. So you're getting out there, you're scouting, you're looking at your plants. Well, know what is actually healthy and what's not healthy. Also know what are common deficiencies. That photo in the middle is of a palm tree. And that is a palm tree that's experiencing a magnesium deficiency. And so our palm trees here in Florida um, often experience either potassium or magnesium deficiencies due to our sandy soils and not having the nutrients that palms need to grow and thrive in those soils. And so supplemental fertilizers is appropriate, um, but you wanna use the appropriate or the correct fertilizer. And we'll talk more about palm fertilizer in just a little bit. But again, that's a sign of a nutrient deficiency. I do wanna quickly mention about palms and that nutrient deficiency in case I forget later on. When you see that, don't prune those leaves off. While they look unsightly, it's actually um, exasperating the problem by pruning those off. So what's happening is, uh, again, depending on where the deficiency is happening, but like in this case, it's happening on the older leaves. And so some of these nutrients are mobile. And so what's happening is the older leaves have decided, I'm gonna take the hit. I want those nutrients to help keep the new leaves flourishing and thriving. So I'm taking the hit. I'm showing this deficiency. If you keep pruning those off, the problem doesn't go away. It just keeps moving up the palm. Again, if we don't um, try to uh, fertilize appropriately and we keep pruning that off, eventually that could lead to the death of the palm tree. So again, while it seems unsightly, it's actually better to leave those yellow leaves on. Um, you'll never be able to recover that, the green back on the yellow, but Again, by fertilizing appropriately, as the tree grows, the new leaves will develop and, and stay healthy as older leaves. That photo on the left, you can see very symmetrical. We can see some yellowing or some chlorotic on the leaf. And then that photo on the right. If you saw that, what would you say? Could be a problem, could not be a problem. What's well, important to know your plants. That's actually how that leaf is designed. That leaf naturally has those yellow spots on it. It's a farfugium, also known as a leopard plant. And so it has that spotting on leaves. I do have to admit, years ago when I first saw that plant, I thought for sure someone had sprayed an herbicide and affected the plant. Um, but nope, that's just how that plant naturally looks. So again, it's important that we know our plants. We know how to look for signs of a deficiency as well when thinking about fertilizing appropriately. Another thing, we mentioned, how do you decide to fertilize? How do you know what to apply? Well, you don't really know until you perform a soil pH test. You can't look at your soil and just know your pH. That also goes back to matching right plant to right place. If we don't know our soil pH, how do we match plants for the appropriate site? Maybe we want to install some acid loving plants. Maybe we'd like to install some azaleas or blueberries. Well, those are plants that prefer a lower pH, more acidic soils. And so it's important that we perform a soil pH test to know, is this site appropriate for those plants? Also, if you're having some problems with your plants, performing a pH test, maybe you already have a landscape, you've, uh, it's already installed, inherited, but you're trying to solve some problems. Having that pH test performed will tell you what your pH is and maybe give you a clue as to what's going on and if your pH is impacting your plant. And so you can see on that chart on the right, depending on your soil pH, Again, the lower end would be considered more acidic. The higher end um, would be considered alkaline. And depending on your soil pH, certain nutrients are not available. So again, that's why matching right plant to right place will help you have plants that are appropriate for that site. Some plants, again, are pretty um, easygoing. They're not as picky to their soil pH. Some plants are very particular about soil pH and what nutrients are available. So again, these are all clues that will help us to fertilize more appropriately. So thinking about different types of fertilizer, how do you select fertilizer? Well, we often think of fertilizer as either a quick release or a slow release fertilizer. And so quick release fertilizer is often known as a, a soluble fertilizer. 
is actually released very quickly. It usually has less than a 30 day response period. So you apply that fertilizer and it's only available to the plants for 30 days or less. So very quick, you get a very quick response. When you think about slow release fertilizers, they're slowly released into the environment, into the soil for the roots to take up. Think about that. That's actually more, um, what happened that's um, more like what happens in nature nutrients are slowly released through think about like um, organic materials in the soil um, leaves falling things like that they slowly release nutrients for the plants and so um, slow release fertilizers release over you know several months maybe uh, three months maybe four months it just depends again you want to always read the label of your fertilizer to know you know what to expect and how often to apply as well so again, anytime you can apply, um, if appropriate, utilize a slow release fertilizer. Now, you're selecting your fertilizer. There's a lot of information, again, on that bag or container, that label, if you will, that you need to look for. And so um, the nutrients that are contained in that are contained on the label. Often you'll see those three numbers on the front those indicate the percent of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in that bag. Those are considered macronutrients. Macronutrients are nutrients that plants need in larger quantities. Many of these nutrients are available in soils, but not always. And so that's why sometimes fertilizer is appropriate. Um, some secondary macronutrients include magnesium, calcium, and even sulfur. So again, these are nutrients that plants need in larger quantities. Micronutrients are nutrients that plants need in smaller quantities. So maybe boron or iron, these are micronutrients. They're not needed in large quantities. And so um, again, you may find those in a different um, section of the fertilizer label to let you know that those are also included. Another thing to consider with your fertilizer is organic versus inorganic. Now your organic fertilizers are gonna be derived from plants or animals. Many of the nutrients may be slow released, but not always. So again, it's important that you um, look at the nutrients and look at um, what's contained in there. Now, one thing to consider with your organic um, fertilizers is that they may have high levels of phosphorus. And so often here in Florida, our, nat our native soils already contain high amounts of phosphorus. So often when we're fertilizing, we should be looking for zero um, or very little phosphorus in that middle number. And unless you have a, a, a soil test that says your um, soil does not contain phosphorus, you really should not be applying phosphorus at all. So again, just keep that in mind with your organic um, fertilizers. And again, that's all in an effort to um, keep out those, um, the nitrogen and the phosphorus, those nutrients from our bodies of water, which can um, negatively impact them. Now, some other um, forms of organic fertilizers could be um, animal manure. I think we're all familiar with that. Could be compost, could be blood or bone meal, or even fish emulsion. These are all examples of an organic fertilizer. Now, inorganic fertilizers are um, they're materials that are synthesized from inert materials. Now, they can be quick release or slow release. So again, you want to consider that. Uh, again, and again, whatever is appropriate for your site, for your plants, and for that time of year. These are all things to consider. A little bit more about that fertilizer label. So again, I talked about the three numbers that you often see large on the front of the label are going to be the percent of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Um, you'll often hear it referred to as NPK. That's what uh, those uh, letters stand for. So let's just look at this bag as an example. So it's a 15-0-15. So we have 15% 15 nitrogen, no phosphorus in this bag. That seems appropriate uh, unless our site is deficient or, or lacks phosphorus. And then 15% potassium. Well, what size bag is this? Well, you don't know that, but this is a 50 pound bag, or let's say this is a 50 pound bag. So how much actual nitrogen is in this bag? How many pounds of this bag are actually nitrogen? Well, you would take 15% of 50. So seven and a half pounds of this bag are actually nitrogen. Seven and a half pounds are potassium. 
So there's some other materials in there as well. That's just something to consider. Could be micronutrients, could be um, the materials that help form this fertilizer. So again, this is all important for you to know. When you're applying fertilizer, you need to know the percent nitrogen. You need to know how to calculate how much fertilizer to apply as well and know how much total nitrogen you have. So these are all clues and that's why it's so important that we read that fertilizer label. One thing I wanna mention about utilizing fertilizers is that it's recommended to not use weed and feed products. Now, um, it might seem like that's a really great product because it's gonna have everything that you need. I'm gonna put down my fertilizer. I'm going to deal with my weeds all at once. Well, it's actually not a great idea. And why is that? Well, the time that we apply, um, and so these weed and feeds, let me back up. The, the herbicide that they contain is often a pre-emergent. What does that mean? That's an herbicide that's applied before the weeds actually germinate. A pre-emergent herbicide stops those seeds from germinating. And that's usually what's contained in weed and feed products. So the time that you apply that was mid-February, if it was for like a warm season annual weed. Your pre-emergent should have been applied um, a couple weeks ago. When do we start fertilizing? Not in mid-February here in Central Florida. We don't start fertilizing until the end of March or early April. So again, the timing is off on those two things. The other thing to consider is some of those pre-emergent products can actually damage um, if applied in the landscape near the roots of woody trees and shrubs can actually damage those woody trees and shrubs. You might see um, leaves that have um, been affected. They might die. Uh, they might be turning different colors. And so again, you wanna be careful where you were applying it if you were to use it, but again, it's not recommended. So if you have weeds to treat in the landscape, you spot treat those, use the appropriate either pre-emergent or post-emergent. And so post-emergent is once your weeds have already sprouted, you're trying to um, deal with the weeds that um, are there. When you fertilize, you just put fertilizer down and you do a broadcast application of that where appropriate, again, depending on um, whether it's your lawn or landscape or whatever. But again, um, these two products should be applied separately. So now we'll look at a few tips for fertilizing your landscape. And again, this is pretty general because there are so many landscape plants that you have. We don't have time to talk about all of those today, but I'm just giving you some keys to think about when you're fertilizing your landscape plants. Of course, step one, right plant, right place. You know, if we have the plant, if we have a plant that's not suitable for our site conditions, for our soil pH, and it's constantly stressed, it doesn't have the nutrients available to it, um, sometimes we may need to over fertilize and that's not appropriate that we would be applying um, more fertilizer than is necessary just to keep this plant healthy. So again, think about right plant, right place and what's appropriate for the site. As I mentioned, your established plants and many of your woody trees and shrubs, as long as they're healthy and either flowering or fruiting as appropriate, they may not need fertilizer. Also think about if you're applying fertilizer to your turf grass, your, your landscape plants might already be receiving enough nutrients from that, fer that turf fertilizer application. So consider that. Another thing to consider is that with your landscape plants, and maybe you have some edibles in your landscape, applying too much nitrogen to your fruiting trees can actually cause a lot of leaf growth, but will actually not allow them to fruit. So be very careful. Um, we're not going to talk about um, edible plants today in fertilizer, but I would just caution you. If you're having, you know, if you have a fruit tree and you've been fertilizing like crazy and you haven't been getting any fruit, it might be from too much nitrogen. It's putting all of its energy into those leaves and not actually producing uh, the fruit that you want to enjoy. So again, these are just some things to consider. I do wanna to touch on palm trees though, because they are um, pretty common and have some pretty specific fertilizer requirements. Again, I mentioned earlier, but palm trees are often uh, suffer from nutrient deficiencies due to our, our sandy soils. They just don't have the nutrients that are needed, uh, particularly the potassium and the magnesium, but um, often uh, there could be micronutrient issues as well. The key to palm trees is that preventing these nutrient deficiencies is going to be a lot easier than trying to treat those nutrient deficiencies. And that's because it can take several years to correct those deficiencies. And when I say correct, Again, those yellow leaves are not turning green. 
You just have to let those cycle through and naturally senesce and then you know, get on a, a, an appropriate fertilizer program to keep that palm healthy. Again, when these palms suffer from nutrient deficiencies, we have the yellowing of leaves. We have palms that are stressed out. It can also lead to um, palms that might start um, narrowing or pencil pointing, we sometimes call it, because of this nutrient deficiency and not being able um, to grow properly. So again, it's all related. But again, fertilizing appropriately is most important. You wanna make sure that, and we're gonna talk about the formulation, but you wanna make sure that your palm fertilizer includes magnesium. And you wanna make sure that you're not using um, turf fertilizer that's very high in nitrogen near your palm trees. If you have your palm trees in the middle of your very lush lawn and you see lots of yellow leaves, your turf fertilizer is probably to blame. So that high nitrogen can actually induce or exasperate potassium, excuse me, potassium deficiencies in your palm trees. So it's, it's recommended to not use that, that palm fertilizer within 30 feet of your palm tree, that turf fertilizer within 30 feet of your palm tree. I wanna make sure I said that correctly. Um, your palm fertilizer actually has all of the nutrients that your turf needs. So again, if you have palm trees in the middle of your turf grass, it's actually better to go ahead and use that palm fertilizer um, than that instead of that high nitrogen turf fertilizer. So again, these are all clues we're looking for. If we've got lush green grass and our palm tree in the middle of it is suffering, it might be an issue that we are kind of causing from that high nitrogen. So what are you looking for in your palm fertilizer? Well, the formulation, again, that NPK, and of course, plus magnesium, you're looking for an 8212 or an 8012. So again, that zero is your phosphorus and most of our, our Florida soils are abundant in phosphorus. So we don't need to apply phosphorus, um, but we do need that potassium, that magnesium. And you also wanna include micronutrients as well. Some other keys you wanna look out for, the nitrogen, the potassium, the magnesium, and the boron should be in a slow release form. That's gonna be what's most appropriate for your palm. Again, we talked about um, quick release versus slow release. And so that slow release is gonna slowly release. Again, that quick release has a very quick response period. And so that's not most appropriate for your palms. Now your manganese, that's different than magnesium. Your manganese, your iron, and your other micronutrients should be in a sulfate or chelated um, water soluble form. So again, you're looking for that. And um, I know this might all sound kind of confusing and how are you supposed to memorize that? We've got some great resources on this as well. Um, of course, we'll be providing those to everyone who registered and you can always contact our office if you have any questions. We have some great fact sheets that lay out again what um, you should be looking for in your palm fertilizer. And as I've mentioned, you always wanna read and follow the label instructions. A few more tips on fertilizing your palms. Make sure that you spread it uniformly under the canopy of that palm out to what we would call the drip line or the edge of the, the leaves or the fronds. So you're not just taking a handful or whatever, just tossing it and calling it a day. We're gonna do a nice um, uniform application under the canopy of that palm tree. So again, um, you might use like a hand spreader or something um, if it, you know, just, it, and you're gonna do some calculations because as you can see, you're going to apply one and a half pounds per thousand square feet. So you're gonna to need to do a little calculation, but if you're applying fertilizer, you're doing math. So um, just be comfortable with that or, or learn how to do that or contact our office if you have any questions. The other key is to regularly apply this fertilizer to your palm trees to keep them healthy. So every three months. Now here in central Florida, we actually can go ahead and skip that winter application, but uh, February, May, August, or somewhere around there, every three months, go ahead and apply your palm fertilizer as appropriate. And as I mentioned, we've got some great resources that go over all of um, the fertilizer label requirements and how to um, appropriately apply your palm fertilizer and also nutrient deficiencies as well to look for. So now we're gonna talk about fertilizing your turf grass. So we do want a healthy lawn, right? If we have a lawn, we wanna keep it healthy because it can function. It can help reduce stormwater runoff. It can help reduce heat and noise. Um, it provides a place for recreation. So turf grass can be beneficial, it can be functional, and we wanna keep it healthy. But over fertilizing doesn't necessarily keep that turf grass healthy. 
So I talked about calculating. And of course, with our palm trees, we have to do some calculations. Well, for your turf grass, you should also be doing some calculations. Now, make it as easy as possible, whatever is appropriate for you. Um, maybe you pull up the property appraiser site and do some calculations. Maybe you utilize an online um, map that, that has tools that help you calculate your lawn area. Maybe you get out there with um, some tape measures and, and do a little bit of calculation. Now, maybe your yard is not a nice, neat square or rectangle. That seems complicated, right? Well, don't make it complicated. Just turn that um, amoeba into some type of square or rectangle so that you can get the area. And that's gonna be your length times width. And break your yard up into specific areas so that you can fertilize more appropriately. Again, if you haven't done this before, it's gonna take some practice to make sure that you don't um, use all the fertilizer that you had for your entire yard in just your backyard. Again, you've got a front yard, potentially a side yard, things like that. And so breaking it up and then uh, appropriately measuring out what to use in those areas is going to keep your lawn healthy, keep those excess nutrients out, um, and keep you from wasting your time and money as well. Now, when you're thinking about fertilizing your lawn, it's important to know what type of grass you have because there's different recommendations for different types of turf grass. Commonly, people have maybe Bahia grass or St. Augustine grass. You might also have uh, zoysia. Uh, centipede is usually not grown here in Central Florida, um, but you might have one of those top three. So again, with your Bahia grass, uh, you know, maybe one application um, per year uh, or, or one pound. Um, per 1,000 square feet per year. Maybe for your St. Augustine, anywhere from um, two to five pounds per 1,000 square feet per year. Now, one thing to keep in mind is you only want to apply one pound of fertilizer per 1,000 square feet um, per application. And that's for a slow release um, formula. Um, if it's quick release, it's, it's even less fertilizer to apply. But again, for your, your turf, you want to be applying a, a, a slow release fertilizer. And so these ranges are for the site. Think about your site. What's actually appropriate? How much do you actually need to apply, if any at all? So a range is given. But again, you want to make sure that you're following those rules. Um, and so again, we have some great... Um, fact sheets that again talk about all of these application rates and um, what to apply as well. Now um, there are some easy charts to help you as well. So you've done some calculation, right? You've looked at your lawn, you know um, how much area, again that length times width that you need to apply fertilizer to. So you can utilize this chart if you know the square footage that you're applying to and you know um, the percent of nitrogen. And that is 30% or more is slow release guaranteed in that fertilizer. So you would look at your percent nitrogen and you could easily use this chart to know that, okay, let's say I have a thousand square foot yard and I have um, a formulation that has 15% nitrogen. I know that I only need to apply six pounds of fertilizer. What size bag did you purchase? Well, it probably wasn't six pounds. So again, you'll need to do a little bit of um, calculation and um, measuring to make sure that you're applying the appropriate amount. I mean, again, you don't want to over fertilize. You don't want to put down, you know, think about that. If you only needed to apply six pounds and you bought maybe a 25 pound bag or a 50 pound bag and you put that whole bag down, you're not going to have a healthy lawn. You're going to have a very unhealthy, unsightly looking lawn that probably got burnt up and you've also wasted a lot of nutrients and money as well because you didn't need to apply that whole bag. So again, a little bit of prep work. If you're going to do it yourself, um, will save you time and money and keep your lawn healthy and probably keep you happy as well. A few more um, tips on applying fertilizer. Again, we've talked about you want to make sure if you're using um, the spreader that you have that deflector shield on. You want to keep that pointed towards uh, your sidewalk, your driveway, any water bodies as well. Now, when you're applying the fertilizer to avoid that photo on the right, um, you want to make sure that you do crossing patterns and you want to make sure that your, your um, spreader is calibrated as well. Again, if you're not doing an appropriate, um, so you want to apply north to south and, and maybe um, only measure out about, use about half, so you know how much you need to use. Put about half of that in your spreader. 
use that and go north to south. Put the other half in and then walk east to west for that application so you get a more uniform application on your lawn. I know you probably you can't read any of this. Again, we've got a great resource that has this information, but you can probably see the photos. And so what are we doing? Well, we need to measure our lawn. How much area are we actually applying fertilizer to? Again, it's just your lawn area. You don't need to incorporate your landscape area because you're not applying your turf fertilizer to your landscape bed. Make it simple. Again, if, you're, if your yard is not a square or a rectangle, do your best to calculate what a square or rectangular of that area might be. Then you want to utilize that table. Um, again, check your fertilizer label, then measure out the appropriate amount of fertilizer for your size lawn and for the, the fertilizer formula that you have. Before you put the fertilizer in the spreader, make sure it's closed. If the holes are open and you pour the fertilizer in, it's gonna go right through. And I can tell you from personal experience, it does. It doesn't magically close on its own. You have to close the fertilizer before you pour it in the, the spreader. Uh, it's recommended maybe just to put half in at a time and then spread it and put the other half in and then walk back the other way. Again, um, make sure you're on the lawn before you open the spreader to start allowing the fertilizer out of the, of the spreader. Again, walk in that north to south pattern Maybe with the other half of the fertilizer in the spreader, walk an east to west pattern to get a more uniform application. And of course, if any fertilizer is spilled, make sure you sweep it up. Don't just leave it or, or wash it down the, the driveway. The last tip, if you're applying uh, fertilizer, particularly for your lawn, but even thinking back to your palms as well, if you read the fertilizer label, it'll often tell you that you have to water that fertilizer in. And so you wanna water that in, one, to get it off of the leaves, but also get it down to the soil where it can actually um, be used. Again, most of our plant roots are within the top 12 inches of the soil. So we want that fertilizer down in that soil. We don't wanna put too much water down because then you're gonna um, either wash it away or misuse it. So again, you should be applying often, again, read your label, but I'll often say a quarter of an inch of water. And so you might be saying, well, how do I know I'm applying a quarter inch of water? Well, you can do what's called, um, a catch can test or a sprinkler calibration test. So before you put your fertilizer down, you would do this test. And so you would turn your sprinkler system on or however you're gonna water your fertilizer and turn that system on. Um, before that, you wanna have cans um, that are of the same size. So maybe you have some tuna cans or cat food cans. It doesn't have to be that, but those are often what's used because they have the shorter sides. You randomly place those in one zone that you're turning on where you're gonna be applying your fertilizer. Run your zone for 10 minutes. After 10 minutes, get your ruler out, go around and measure how much water is in each of those cans. You wanna add all of those up and divide to get the average. So let's say after 10 minutes, you had, I don't know, a quarter inch of water or half inch of water. If you got that quarter inch of water, you know you just need to run your system for 10 minutes. If you got a half inch of water, you know you only need to run for five minutes to apply that quarter inch of water to appropriately finish applying your fertilizer. So again, it's more than just um, putting some fertilizer out and calling it a day. It's, it's, it's knowing that you also have a step to probably water that fertilizer in as well with only a quarter inch of water. So we've talked about um, some different applications, how to think through applying fertilizer, what to look for in a fertilizer. We've talked about our Polk County fertilizer ordinance. We've also talked about where you can search for um, potentially if you are in a different um, county or city how to look for your fertilizer ordinance to know if you have any other restrictions. We do not wanna use fertilizer within 10 feet of a body of water. Again, it's so important that we keep those nutrients out of the water. Those nutrients lead to algae blooms, they lead to lower oxygen, it can affect aquatic life as well. We wanna keep our water bodies, water bodies healthy and beautiful. And so by keeping those nutrients out of there, we can do that. You should test your soil before you apply fertilizer. That way you know what you're dealing with. Don't um, apply fertilizer before a heavy rainstorm. Use primarily uh, slow release nitrogen sources in your fertilizer. No, uh, low to no phosphorus, again, because our, our native soils are abundant in phosphorus often. And always read the label for any safety precautions, um, for any um, special instructions for applying your fertilizer. 
We have a list of resources that we will be sending out, um, but this is a list of resources with lots of information on the basics of fertilizer, types of fertilizer, information on fertilizing your palms and palm nutrition, how to calibrate your fertilizer spreader. Do you even need to apply fertilizer? We have a great video from one of our extension agents down in South Florida, um, Stephen Brown um, has some really informational videos and, and this is another one to help you out. So um, again, these are great resources that you should consider before you apply any fertilizer. Um, we talked earlier about um, water conservation opportunities with the city of Lake Inn. If you um, are interested in any of the water conservation rebates available, um, either with the city of Lakeland or any other municipalities here in Polk County, um, please feel free to contact Brittany or you can contact um, Beth Robertson as well. And I will send that information out. A few more things before we take any questions. Um, please feel free to contact us. There was a lot of information given today. You might still have some follow-up questions. Um, we do have a plant clinic. As I mentioned, part of Extension is our Master Gardener volunteers and they staff our plant clinic. So you can call us or email us, visit our website. We have some great blog articles as well. You can follow us on social media at Polk Gardening, um, but we're here to help. So please, if you have any gardening or landscaping questions, contact our plant clinic to help clarify those. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Thank you again for City of Lakeland. 